The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue at the knife's edge of what matters most right now. And today we are joined by Cadell Last, Kevin Oros, and Daniel Dick. They are the authors of Sex, Masculinity, and God, The Trialogues. This is a unique book for me uh, because I've been able to read from each of their perspectives as they dialogue with one another, ask each other questions, sometimes disagree, and really have an open exploration and negotiation around these ideas of masculinity and femininity, femininity around gender, around the future of these things, and the, the history of these things, and how we relate to them as people. I'm going to um, start off this session by asking a couple questions. And as questions come up for you, you can drop them in the chat. And then I will call on you to ask your questions. We'll be here for an hour. And so with that said, Cadell, Kevin, Daniel, thank you for being here. I really appreciate you guys joining us at the Stoa today. So, Happy to be here. Great to be here. Tyson, hello, everybody. Hello, Joe. It's a pleasure. Great. All right. <clears throat> so my first question that I have, it's been like ongoing as I've been reading this, is around the, the medium itself and your personal experience of having these conversations and, and writing this book. And so around these topics of sex, masculinity, God, what has changed for you? How have you changed? What sort of uh, personal changes, transformation has happened for you around these topics by having this kind of ongoing conversation? I really find that when I'm reading the book, I'm brought into like your personal experience of how these um, things have come up in your life and how you're grappling with them now and where you're going with them. And so and then there's something about this, that the, the medium of having these conversations with other brothers, with other men, that um, is powerful. And for me, I really uh, appreciate and aspire to that ongoing dialogue that the three of you have been sharing. So I'm curious um, about your experience of the process of writing this book and uh, just ways that you've changed personally by doing so. I can I can jump in here quick uh, to to go off that. I'll, I'll, let me let me just quickly say that it's a really good question and it's a really deep question. For me, it's kind of like I I see this whole process of writing this book and the ongoing trialogues as almost like the third act of my sexual existence. In my in the first act of my sexual existence, I felt as if my sexuality was being regulated by social categories which weren't determined by me. So for example, I didn't determine the categories of boyfriend or girlfriend or the normative patterns that go into enacting those, those forms. Then in this, and when I was doing that, I felt like I was kind of like more robotic, if you like, I was, I was kind of, acting as I'm supposed to act according to a certain social norm. Then in the sort of second act of my life, I became very individual with my sexuality and kind of detaching my sexuality from what other people think or what other people say, just to sort of figure out what I, how I connect to my sexuality. And now with this sex, masculinity and God trialogues, the way I see this as the third act is kind of like I'm in a mature place with myself and I I'm, I'm basically trying to connect with other people who are open to the transformation of identity and sexuality as a, as a kind of networked phenomenon, if that makes sense. 
where identities escape the traditional categorization, but at the same time, it's not an individual experience, it's a collective experience. So that's, that's an ongoing process for me personally, and it, it's really still, you know, early days, I think. I can, I can jump in here and then I'll pass to you, Daniel. Um, I mean, the inception point for this book, it's in the forward or it's in my forward piece of the book, but it is pretty wild. I'll tell the super abridged version. Um, I wanted to go into PhD psychology. I was studying evolutionary psychology, came across Cadell and his blog and his academic work. He was doing anthropology. And then through various synchronicities, I reached out to him via email. And then I saw him by chance chance in a cafe in Santa Cruz, California, where I was living and uh, didn't go up to him because I, was, I wasn't convinced it was him. I was like, that looks like that one philosopher I follow. Um, years later, he would reach out to me based on a video. After I emailed him, like, were you at a cafe at this time in this place? And he's like, yeah, I was there at a conference. And I was like, damn it. And he reached out to me later and then life brought us together. We had a video call and just went like hour and a half deep. And we're like, he's like, you need to meet this other guy. Daniel he's like Terrence McKenna and I was like I love Terrence McKenna and then like we're just writing a book after we start doing these trilogue series it was like very emergent and what what is most interesting about this book is that it was spoken um, I mean I give major props to you Cadell because Cadell in his genius organized way architected it and structured it in the type form but the the speaking the act of speaking it has a different flavor I think um, than any book you'd find where someone sat down with a blank word processor and just started mashing, you know? So as an example, you know, during this, as we're speaking and writing this book into existence, you know, I think I might've been the first one to pop, but massive life changes were happening in accordance with the chapters, breakups, movements, business wins and losses, um, crisis of existential magnitude you know and then we're like working together sharing this and then also writing the book and it continues we published it two months ago and we're still in this process right now and uh it's really incredible so i'm grateful to be here with you all i'll see you daniel yeah thank you yeah i, I just have to to uh tell the, that for, for me it has been like this so this whole transformative part of this uh, conversation because I just mentioned that in my preface that this whole book was like symbolized by the Orobus, the, the snake that eats its tail because on one hand we, we're talking about sex that is actually something very transformative itself it has like the archetype of the snake something that shapes its, its old skin away and on the other hand it's like the force of life and when it eats its tail, it's because you make this full circle, which is also on 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 the cover of the book, you know, which is uh, leaned on on the sand circle, and the gap in between. So Kadal and we also have a lot of conversation about the gap in the whole whole circle. But um, actually, this kind of transformative, reflective dialogues that we have been drawn into had real impact on, on the personal life. So I want me to break up, you know, changing job and so on. One of the most crucial things that, that really stayed kind of, or that really um, were perpetually going on in, in this phase was actually the last chapter where we talked about death and, and love. So what makes you sure about what you're doing, you know? And this deep questioning about sexuality, what moves you, what is ethically on what you do and how you proceed to gain something meaningful out of your life and in your relationships and how you can measure yourself on, on your right path or not by, by asking yourself, do you love it? And would you do it if you would die tomorrow? You know, that's kind of like, it, I became more radical in that. Yeah, that's like the, the biggest change to, to be really more radical and really enjoy the, the free fall. The free fall that you have 
if you want to jump from somewhere and if you are in love and you just fall, you know, and you, you just take the courage to do it. That became more courage, like that became more radical. Yeah. Wonderful. That's really good. When you're speaking about the space in the center of the circle, I was um, remembering a conversation about how when we, someone was mentioning that when they look at stars, they're typically not really looking at a star. If they do long enough, they kind of lose sight of it. And they're, they, got, they look at the space between the stars. And that's also how the, the shapes and the stories and the figures come together is through the space in between all the stars. And I was um, being brought back to that. I'm, we've been having a lot of conversations here at the STOA and about all kinds of different things. What I really appreciate about it is that it's sort of an embodiment of complexity and holding many different perspectives, which is something I think you guys strive to do in the book is um, speak about all, um, a lot of different ways that people relate to sexuality, gender, and these polarities. And with all these conversations that were happening and Aaron is here, who's been doing um, a session around metamodern masculinity. So a lot of people are involved in kind of having these conversations um, themselves. And then our central focus, I think, no matter what we're talking about, is around building communitas, like connecting with one another, relating in a deeper, more rich and meaningful way. And so having these conversations, what, which at times seem quite um, challenging, uh, and by being honest, as, as you are, and, and in my experience with others, by being honest, it can allow some chaos and confusion and ambiguity in to the conversations. And so, but you, you do so in between the three of you quite artfully and, and masterfully being t articulating um, your personal experiences and, ide and these ideas and asking questions that might um, for some be controversial or off limits or taboo not to ask. So I'm just, I'm curious what have been some guiding principles for you in how to have these conversations, how to engage with openness and to invite openness in others um, with just each other, the three of you, and maybe with other people as well. Um, yeah, guiding principles for having these, these dialogues around things that might be taboo in a generative and productive way. I think, I think one of the crucial notions, at least for me, that has, it's been a huge process of discovery, which is always ongoing, which is to be aware of the way in which you're unconsciously identifying yourself with certain ideas. So if you're unconsciously identifying yourself with certain ideas, I feel like if someone critiques or disagrees with you, you can sort of take it too personally and then it sort of becomes, it becomes too emotionally charged and you lose, you lose sight of what is really being discussed or even what the disagreement is about. So, you know, I think one of the first moves is this ability to realize that your intellect serves the way in which you're unconsciously identifying. And for me, you know, I, like in the past, I would unconsciously identify too much as a certain type of academic. And I would reify my identity around that too much. And I think releasing myself from that gives me the, the freedom to basically interact with anyone about almost anything. If I'm not too much clinging to any one idea as too much identified with myself, then the second principle is to be aware that the very form of the discourse, like the very form of the discursive arena, um, changes the nature of what can be discussed. So one of the biggest things for me is that when I was in academia, I was in a very interdisciplinary environment that where in principle you could talk about anything, but I found that what was implicit in the academic structure was a type of modality of professorship where the discourse was shaped all around that one professor's ideas. So in reality, we couldn't talk about anything. We could only talk about the paradigm accepted by that professor. So in that sense, even though I was at an interdisciplinary environment, 
I felt personally that topics of sexuality, topics of masculinity, and topics of religion were off, were off topic. You, you couldn't really go deep into those topics of sex, masculinity, and God. So that's really why I found and tried to network with Kevin and Daniel, because I was searching for spaces to go deep into those topics, and I, wanted, I didn't want to have any censorship. I didn't want to have any pre-conceptualization to change the way I want to approach those ideas. And so I think that's, that's, that's really the way I would approach that. And I'll throw it to you, Kev. Yeah, brilliant. I, I love that. I've had a similar experience. Um, I didn't even make it to grad school, but on my way, I had a very similar sense working in um, graduate student laboratories. And for me, the, the guiding principles, Tyson, I love these questions, um, really revolve around some notions I have about reality itself, which is language is a bleeding edge. Language is a multidimensional template whatever that means, like multidimensional, doesn't have to mean, you know, quantum physics. It just means language is a type of magic. It's a type of structuring principle or scaffolding onto which culture itself is built. So if that's the case, which I believe it is, um, then we can only evolve as fast as our language. The breadth and width and depth of our conversations are going to determine the level we can heal, connect, and build a new civilization, which is pretty obviously here in 2020 what we kind of need to do. And I see some of the biggest divides around the taboos, especially between the masculine and feminine and sexuality, and around God itself and the, the notion of God, right? And this, this is part and parcel of the issue of the whole idea of censorship or taboos in general, it's like, let's not talk about or language these things. Let's not categorize these things because we don't know what to do with them. That's what, I'm, that's what I hear culture say when it creates a taboo. So obviously the, the, the role of a philosopher and I self-style, self-identify as a philosopher, I believe Daniel and Cadell do as well. The philosopher who's a lover of wisdom, their role in the society is actually to bring these things up create context, create culture, and create conversations around them. So we kind of chose three titanic type taboos to do this in. Um, and quickly, some of the other guiding principles, definitely iron sharpens iron. So what's unique about these conversations is that we, we don't agree on a lot of things. Later, we might agree and come to a level where like, oh, I really see your perspective. It actually gels with my perspective. But in the beginning, we were, we were, you know, just giving out ideas and maybe disagreeing, maybe changing or shifting perspective. So um, healthy competition, a more of a martial artist or dojo style of iron sharpens iron. If I can speak something at the limit of my understanding to you, and like as Cadell was describing, you don't become emotionally compromised and you can speak back your response at the edge of your understanding, we both grow in our knowledge and our gnosis. And so that's an incredible part of this trialogue and what's really unique is unlike a dialogue or a dyad, a dyad tends to reach a stability or an energetic where there isn't a lot of room because it's just that, 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 like think like ping pong. In the triad, in the structure of a triangle, it creates a very unique third chaotic element, which actually most of our trilogues and most of the chapters of the book, the territory we end up in with our ideation is so far afield and so much more potent than what we created in the structure. So there's an emergent property of it that is incredible. I'll pass to you, Daniel. Thank you, yeah. I can just underline everything what is said so far. And there's underline the appreciation that we have been able to talk that freely together and, and bring this out. Because I was just pursuing a PhD, which uh, I now also dropped it because the, the frameworks of academia have been like too tight for me. And to have this conversation with Carol and Kevin was just relieving, was, you know, because I could combine different notions of investigation. On one hand, you have like the analytic investigation that I appreciate very much where you scrutinize one thought. On the other hand, you have the metaphorical investigation that opens up your mind into patterns. So you see similar patterns all over which is very much from one field that I also appreciate very much is system science. So you 
try to find similar patterns all over uh, different aspects or different, well, in system science, you call them systems, you know? And one thing that always is interested about language and uh, taboos is that when you talk about a taboo, it's not taboo anymore, you know? So there is something very unique about talking about what is hidden, talking about what is sacred, because what is sacred is the same as taboo. And what is sacred and what is taboo, you actually don't touch, you don't talk about it. Why is that so? Because in this is the most initial core of our and our driving. It's that what we want to reach for. And that is something very unconscious usually. It can be sex, it can be God, but it drives you to, to really focus on, on something without knowing what it is in this black box because it's taboo, because it's sacred, because you don't talk about it. So once you talk about it, you bring it to the light, you bring it to the transparency and you change it. So the biggest thing about talking about taboo and talking about sex, talking about God, and be kind of heretic to that. It's the willingness to change because it will change you. And that's what happened so much into, in, in these conversations too. You know, it is, it is a mechanism itself that you also find in psychotherapy and stuff like that. But if you bring it to that level, it brings you massive changes because you have to question a lot if you question these kind of so intrinsic taboo topics and yeah i think that that's like the, the most crucial part if you want to really focus on this conversations that bring you a way of change that you are progressing in your self-development that you're open to to make yourself change you know that you are open to discover what is what is the hidden behind the hidden. To to reveal that will change you, and you have to have the willingness to do that. Yeah. Really good, thank you. Well, Alex S's question is pointing in the direction that I was going to go next, so I'm just going to invite Alex to unmute and ask your question if you'd like, Alex. Alex S, do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me now, Tice? Yep, heard that. Great, thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, thanks to all the speakers. Uh, I think this is a really important uh, topic to be discussing. Um, I found in my own experience, so I'm in my 30s, um, just a lot of confusion, you know, uh, coming of age and not really uh, having a clear sense of what it means to be a man, uh, what masculinity actually is supposed to be. And, um, you know, all kinds of models from my past, you know, parents, uh, family members, et cetera, that don't really fit with present reality. Um, and also, you know, whenever I've gone out and tried to uh, get some advice, just getting a lot of blank stares in response. You know, you ask a man, you know, uh, you know, somebody in my family, let's say, well, what is a man and what do you do? You know, should you get married? Should you not? Um, and not really getting clear answers to those questions uh, or really a kind of um, guidance for how do you find out? You know, how do you make these decisions for yourself? And uh, so my question is, um, so I appreciate, you know, the need to be in discussion and to be uh, inquiring. And I'm wondering if you've arrived at any kind of um, uh, maybe a sense of what the meaning of masculinity is in our time. You know, you mentioned uh, it's a post-religious age we live in. It's, a, uh, it's an age of post-feminism and uh, a lot of sexual uh, changes have happened. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any sense, you know, what is the meaning of masculinity for us today? Uh, is there such a thing? Um, are there any 
um, maybe like points or moments or aspects of that that we can talk about? You know, what is a man in our world? Thanks. Thanks for the question, Alex. And I think it's really well framed and really thought out. And I really feel, I really feel the emotion behind your your question. And it's and it's an emotion that I I share I share with you. In the in the conversation, in some of the conversations we've had specifically about um, gender archetypes, and in some of the conversations we specifically had about um, masculine movements. I can I can open um, sort of how we've approached this this question that you're posing, which is that in the past, before the modern period, um, man and woman were seen to be eternal essences. They were seen to be, um, you know, it would be impossible for someone in the 15th century to question their gender identity. It, 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 it was the essence of their being. It, it, it wasn't something where there's a reflective distance. Of course, that all changes in the modern world. And that largely changes because the whole traditional structure um, kind of gets divided from within, where in the traditional world, there's a, there's a distinction between the public sphere and the private sphere. And in the modern world, that distinction is kind of annihilated. And in, the, in some sense, everyone is now in the public sphere. And I don't think anyone would say that that move is ethically wrong. I think that everyone should be <laughs> fully in the public sphere and everyone should be um, fully able to express and perform and act in the public sphere. Nonetheless, the question of what that means for contemporary masculinity is something that I think we've barely begun to scratch the surface of. So let me quickly say that what I see in contemporary masculine movements is a type of strange um, inner identity tension between, and this can be seen in, for example, the red pill community. And this, 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 this inner tension is between the man who wants to enact the traditional life of 50 years ago and the man who wants to just um, give in to his base level evolutionary impulses. So the man who just wants to enact the old traditional scaffolding is basically looking for some order, looking for some symbolic certainty that would allow him to contain his sexual energy. Whereas the man who's just acting on his evolutionary impulses is basically saying no conceptualization scheme works i'm just going to do what is natural to my body and from my point of view both are dead ends and what i would offer as a potential third way and this is a third way that i'm trying to work out in myself it's not a, it's not something that i have a final answer for but that third way is trying to connect deeply with the real of my evolutionary impulse, not to deny it, to accept that that's in my body and that's, that's a part of me and that's strong energy. But second, to connect that energy to a higher communal ideal of leadership. So for me personally, what masculinity would be able to do is authentically connect with their sexual energy and then, and then sublimate that energy to a new communal ideal of leadership. But that new communal ideal of leadership would of course take a much different form in the networked age. In the networked age, look at what we're doing right now. This is, this is a, a digital network. None of us are connected in physical reality. Nonetheless, I hope in my speech, I'm bringing a type of you know, masculine type of leadership through sublimation and that that does good for the men and women who are in my network. So that would be my first start to the answer. And I'll pass it to you, Kev. Yeah, I love what you said there. I mean, <laughs> there's a part of me that will pull kind of an Alan Watts here. And it's like, you know, this is like water asking why it's wet. If you're a man asking what masculinity is, it's like, there's a part of me that just wants to point out the absurdity of it. Because in a way, masculinity 
is is like is like the suchness if you're in a male body you know you're you're masculine on one level and obviously there's so many shades now and gradients and i obviously experience those as well so that being said you know um the reason this question is being asked i imagine and the reason i feel like masculinity is in crisis and confusion and i can feel even in my body right now like a little bit of the the anger and like despair that this is a problem in our age and and like i i've experienced it and with all, all of that energy is why i've followed this path which has led me to this call and writing this book with these two gentlemen we've lost rites of passage we've lost the rituals of initiation and we've lost positive male mentors and elders who contextualize and create the positive masculine imago image role for boys to come into and and just and you don't need to like do an exhaustive anthropological study on this merely look to the masculine role models produced by western culture toxic images of machismo psychopathy abuse i mean even the most watered down ones think about the hardcore like tv cop or like the action hero in hollywood they they exude a lot of alpha male positive leadership qualities provision protection providence these are these are part and parcel of the masculine essence however the heart emotional intelligence treating women and children with respect leading the tribe to some total zero game goals as masculine leaders and role models co-creating with a tribe or village is absent because this individual lone wolf be with as many women as you can make as much money as you can you know i don't need to give you the litany of the toxic male images and me too has awakened this to the whole collective in a way that's very unique in our network day just kadel was pointing out so it's it's quite incredible now what what do i think that masculinity means in a post religious post feminist world it's going to look like think of the most grounded integrated man you've known in your life and just start to intuit and feel the qualities he possessed how did he treat younger males how did he treat other powerful men what were his actions and his words were they in alignment and integrity in the communal sphere and you brought up a great point of delineation kadal between the public and private sphere we've had public figures and public men leading our civilization but in the private sphere and now with the internet we're finding out it was a shit show for a lot of these men riddled with addiction and abuse so a true image of masculinity and again this is a working hypothesis i'm trying to enact this with my own struggles and foibles is a man that is uniting those together is not afraid to to take off his armor and admit that he needs help the age of the lone wolf is dead what we need are men who are embodying a life-giving archetype of masculinity and that's why i think part of the impulse for this book is much of our culture worships death it's a death culture and a lot of the masculine figures although they look real shiny on the podium with their suit and tie um death culture is what is propping them up so the ultimate thing is like if a man is going to embody true masculinity it must be life-giving for the culture for the for the whole and i'll leave it there beautiful words in here strong words um what is the masculinity today i mean we have pointed out now a bit the problems that led to this uh question in which uncertainty has been all over in identity of masculinity as well as in other areas of of our world and that was one of the questions why we are so or one of the issues why we wrote this book to give some orientation about this question which we kind of also let it open on one hand it is important to have the firm masculinity that it's opposing uh, a femininity so we had talked about so the oneness that you create in relation to a feminine so i think that is one path that is very crucial and needs a firm balance and this balance is not something that is firm 
for itself, but is in relation to the feminine. So how you can make a compliment on a healthy way to the feminine being a masculine. And the other way is really finding this complementarity in yourself, where you are not searching for the one to become the one with someone else, but where you try to become in yourself completed, fulfilled, realized, where you also can embrace in yourself as well as masculine as a feminine energies. So that is something I, I don't agree fully with Kevin. I see it both ways are very important. So on one hand, what, what Kevin is saying about we need strong man that stay. And here I also agree to Kadal, we need this positive way of man that know what they can, that know what they want. I think this leadership type of man is needed with some new connotations, which is something more feminine, like being a lot of in communication that allows this network of self-determined individuals. And, and by doing that, I see also the possibility that there is like a balance in yourself, but always in relation to someone else that you also can perceive as someone as one. You know, the question is really, what is, what is the lack in yourself that you perceive that you might want to fulfill with someone else? And this lack is also kind of what, what, what drives you or that drives your unconscious. And in, in your relationships, when you learn to start to really uh, see someone else that you love actually, and you finding out, oh, what you love about the other person is actually something that I would like to love about myself. You know? And if you see this continuous process is of self-development, of self-discovery, where you can find actually your strength to see that is what I can, that is what I want, and this is what I stand for. Then there is also a proper collaboration in the network possible where there is not the blaming, where there's not the, the power mechanism where you can respect mutually and same equally to each other. Could be a man or a woman, doesn't matter. But I think this self-development is, is quite crucial. And the, the real question about the masculinity is how did, how did we get into this uncertainty and how does it really help us to, to jump into this uncertainty to, to ask ourselves what is what we want for, for oneself? What is what we want for our community? I think that the uncertainty is a great blessing that we are drawn into individually, on gender, on identity, as well as on, on the state of the world, because it, it initiates the change. It is the first step to, to a new path. And, and I think we need that definitely. And for, for a healthy outcome out of that, is really looking first inside of oneself and discover what is the lack, what is, where, where is not the love and the compassion for oneself? You know, where do we try to find it somewhere else? Where do we try to find security in something else? Where do we try to find leadership in someone else? Where do we try to find love from someone else? So I do think that these things are crucial for community life but how we can stand on a ground that we can give that ourselves first so we are not acting out of a lack, but out of abundance. No. Awesome. Fiona, Daniel is touching, uh, I think, around your question now. So I'm wondering if you want to ask your question or follow up um, with where your question is at now, considering Daniel's comments. Um, I was wondering what, I mean, we've talked a lot about this being a post-feminist era, but feminism is obviously an ongoing philosophy and movement. What could it do differently to create space for 
the development of masculinity and you know a safe space for masculinity to grow i can i can uh i can take that because i have something of a history with engagement with academic feminism for the past 10 years i remember when i started college um i was in a community college and one of the um one of the courses they offered was gender studies but when i was taking the course what was obvious was that it wasn't really gender studies it was it was really it was really women's studies and it was viewing gender from basically from the perspective of femininity so and i've seen that be a problem that's gone on now for a while so my basic answer to your question i hope this is i hope this is precise and simple which is that for me if feminism is going to make room for ma for, for masculinity to really think through itself in a new way then we need to we need to structure gender studies around the idea of positive tension between masculine and feminine energies tension between masculine and feminine energies is really important and if we don't balance the tension between masculine and feminine energies we either get masculine domination or feminine domination and neither serves the whole so i think paradoxically in order to serve the whole we need to understand the tension between the two and from that perspective we can reinvent each other in a ongoing symbiosis with each other because if the feminine changes then the masculine will change and if the masculine changes the feminine will change and we need a space that can contain that tension and I think that that would be very interesting to see. But uh, then I'll sh share that with you, Kevin. That's all I have to say on that topic. Yeah, this is this is very interesting. And this comes up a lot in my my profession. I'm a I'm a coach for entrepreneurs and I do emotional integration work, archetypal shadow work as well. And um, a lot of my clients are really powerful women in business. And this is the number one question they ask is like, how can we support men to heal and integrate, right? Because um, in the, some of the circles I've run in, maybe um, the conscious community, the health and wellness community, whatever you want to call it, the women have been doing their work longer. Um, they've been gathering, doing red tent, doing, doing ceremony, doing deep healing and interpersonal work. And the men now are really rising. And I see the last decade and really the last couple of years um, to really see more and more groups activate and activate. I think Mankind Project was been holding it down, but there's so many new groups doing this. And a big part of that is, you know, the taboo around men showing any kind of emotion, any kind of vulnerability at all walks of life, right? From your working class firefighter, police officer, but even, you know, the male yoga teacher or the male corporate gentleman, you know, those taboos are finally breaking down and there's finally enough context and healing momentum that I think we can start to have those circles emerge more and more and more. Now, to the question of the direct relationship, um, this one's tough because it addresses one of the biggest shadows between masculine and feminine, which is the shadow of codependency. And so if the woman is unwilling to detach from the man's process, not try to be his therapist, but also simultaneously without demasculating him or causing any female deferment or all these other things that have been identified, um, allowing him and to courageously do his work, even if it involves dissolution and really painful ego annihilation, which it often does. And in the same way, if the woman's doing her work and is connecting with other sisters and, and powering up and clearing some of her trauma, which you know, one in three women have like serious sexual trauma. I mean, this is a this is a systemic thing that touches all of us. In the same way, that man has to avoid becoming her therapist and demeaning, controlling, trying to fix, trying to rush in with problem solving. So that the very relationship between masculine and feminine at the core one on one level is a microcosm of the men and women's work that has to happen and gets to happen. 
So the very simple way to support it either way is to support it and not to meddle and understand, even though your intentions are good, that you know, there's some things that men can only do with other men and vice versa. There's some things that women can only do with other women. And uh, I think one of the most dangerous things is this blurring and, you know, it's not, I don't want to say it's transgenderism because that's not what it is, but this whole idea that gender is just a role or it doesn't matter. And, you know, the men and women's exclusion is a bad idea. I don't agree with that at all, just from personal experience, you know, all philosophy and concepts aside. So, yeah, I really look forward to more women, whether they feel like they're in the feminism strain or not, and more men, even if they're in more traditional alpha male roles, to start to realize the importance of this work and to just actually support one another, even if it's at a distance. So I'll leave it there for you, Daniel. Thank you. There have been so many questions coming up here on, on the right side. And so beautifully framed. Uh, I just want to, I mean, there is a lot to talk about in here. So it makes it difficult to recap all the questions that are already here. And the first question that has been uh, asked to, to, to make this round fully. Um, but I, I want to make some, some comment about Durkheim. Um, about the sacred and the profane that uh, was asked because um, it, it touches several questions that has been asked here too, including the, the first question. What is, what is the spaces that we need? And here comes a so kind of a paradox where we hold attention. It is, we need a sacred space for the transformation. So the sacred is like the unification, it's where we are drawn into. The sacred space is an empty space too, because it can allow things to happen. So one of the crucial things that, that we need is just give yourself the time, you know, where you don't have to do something. Give, allow yourself just to be and, and that brings up also a lot of things especially if you make it something sacred it's because it's special to you it's like the first act of, of self-compassion the second is that when we when we uh, unify in something sacred it's um it is because we we really care on one hand if we have something that we want to change about ourselves and we, we, we talk about the most sacred that's, that's on ourself, it is something that we can talk about sex, we can talk about our most intimate relationship and as said, it, it changes. And when, when it comes to say, um, what is what is really crucial about masculinity and what do we bring to ourselves and to, to the compassion that we can make out of the sacred spaces? I believe that everybody brings something on the table and Everybody is kind of different in what he can really offer. And everybody has something that, that is really unique to him. And this is actually the, the most sacred point where you, where you can reach. But to discover this and to hold spaces for that, it's like the second sacred space loop in which you can just unfold and detach of everything that you thought about that you have to. And, and this makes you like the king in, in the archetype where you say, that's what I want. You know, all of that makes you the magician that says, this is, the create, this is the reality that I create. But I do believe that, especially in our times, in our civilization that we are 
uh, right now. We can create time. And this is something so crucial. Like you have the time. You don't have to hurry from one thing to the other. You have to take your time for yourself. This is the very first act of self-compassion that leads you to discover yourself. And, and to and people like Kevin that do these coachings, you know, or that you take the time to listen to these podcasts, you know, is actually already the first step that you care about yourself. And yeah, I think these are already steps, but the, the ultimate step is when you become the creator of your reality, you become the creator of what is intrinsic unique to you. When you become the, the architect that you wanna be, that you become the author that you wanna be and so on. But the, the beauty about it is, is where do you find the spaces where you can co-create with such individuals on this level? You know, and I'm really glad I found Kevin and Cadell on, on that path, you know, to be a part of a co-creation where you're just standing in your truth and you're making your part what you're doing best. And to to get into an, another round of, of, it's not only about the individual, it is how to collaborate, how to communicate. This is our network area. How do how do we can be free from any chains of thoughts to create something meaningful? And how do we manage this to do this? Is I think the next step that I'm really intrigued to to see in stuff like small villages or um, self determined communities and stuff like that. And also to uh, put put on uh, one question was like, do we going for tribal community masculinity? I think the network, like the digital nomadism or digital local community that has notions of tribal is bringing this to, to a full circle. What I can see also in the future where you are actually very linked to the nature and to permaculture stuff or really touching nature as well as your sex as, as your nature, but you also can be highly connected through the digital age and network through the global spirit of united humanity. But in, in between is the self-development of, of doing that. And this is going to be still a long walk to do together, but I think here are pioneering ideas and also strong individuals that, that have the courage to walk this path of self-determination that is what really meant the, the enlightenment to really say we we are not bowed to to anything but our 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 mind and we really want to do something out of not because someone is telling us but because we want it that was the initial part of democracy but i think we're now able to do that on, because of the technological level but on a physical and psychological, emotional and mental level, we're still lacking very much behind to really ask us the question, do we really doing what we want? Yeah, because it's hard, you know. Yeah, I, I give it to, to all these other questions. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, this is really good. And the questions are going off in the comments. Um, do you guys want to do you have do you, would you like to stay and answer a couple more questions? Or should we wrap up here? For us, there's for me, there's no time limit, we can keep going. Okay. Well, I would like to invite Aaron to and that's good with you as well, Daniel. I see Kevin's got a thumbs up. Um, I want to go to Aaron with where your question is at now. Um, I think Daniel touched on it a bit and then invite Levi as well to then um, take in because you your questions circle around a similar thing. So then if Levi wants to take in and just um, build on that, I think that would be good. So Aaron, will you um, go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, thanks Tyson. Uh, thanks guys for being here. This is really awesome. I, I really can sense this conversation could keep going. I want to know more. I want to talk to you guys more. Um, but yeah, my question is that uh, it sounds to me as if you're championing a uh, tribal communal masculinity, like returning to sort of the uh, collected networked masculinity. Um, it also sounds like you're championing 
um, championing like sexual self-discovery and liberation. Um, and since men naturally compete over women, sort of in a tribal setting, uh, do you guys also champion traditional monogamy and, um, or something else? And do you, do you see some sort of uh, sexual regulation that needs to be imposed if you're going to have a tribal way of life for men, you might say? Thanks so much for your question, Aaron. I, I, I love this question. I, I, it's, it's a question that has, it occupies so much of my mind. Um, I have, I, my, per, my personal view is that one of the reasons why Marxism was so, so much of a failure and one of the reasons why practical communist politics is so ineffective is because they don't have an adequate theory of human psyche and socio-sexual development. And one of the biggest roadblocks to authentic communism of communal style of living is of course that our sublimations fall in a stable pattern within what we call the nuclear family between a man and a woman raising children. And overcoming that as a stable erotic geometry or a stable life geometry is to me the biggest possible challenge you, you could think. So I don't have, I don't have concrete um, answers, but what I can say is that whatever our sexual nature, it does not fall into a stable category. Meaning if you say polyamory, if you say monogamy, if you say whatever category you use, our sexuality does not fit neatly into a category. It rebels against any mental abstractions of this nature. And that makes it extremely chaotic. And that makes it extremely emotionally intensely disturbing. And most of our identities vis-a-vis -vis sexuality are, in my view, reaction formations against the chaos of this fact. To give some stability, to give some mental coherence to the intrinsic chaos of this energy. How this, now, now what we can say concretely is that this energy does find some stability in what we call the nuclear family, precisely because man and woman are linked by the child. Now, man and woman being linked by the child is, I think, in this sense, one of the most authentic sublimations that you can give your life to. Because I had a conversation, for example, with, um, with one of my PhD colleagues who wrote a book and he has many, and he has children, and he was re just remarking over how much more complex and how much more real his children seem to him than his books or his PhD thesis. So there's a way in which our cultural sublimations pale in comparison to our biological sublimations of actually having a child. So if my, here's, my final, here's my final thought on this, on this problem, is if you're going to have a transcendence to a higher order level of social being in a communal setting, you have to treat very carefully how these relations are synergistically coherent with reproduction. If you don't figure out how the synergies are coherent with reproduction, it will, be, it will be a nightmare and it will fall apart and it will disintegrate. So that to me is one of the biggest horizons for thinking today and contemporary philosophy. Yeah, I'll quickly give my, my two pence here. Um, I agree with Cadell, this is the most problematic um, situation in communal environments and having lived on eco villages and talked to a lot of people creating them, even here in Bali, talking to people creating them. Um, the number, the number one and two things that destroy intentional communities are sex and money, which relate to power, obviously the third hidden one. Um, and the sexuality one, it's like, we've been so repressed in the Christian West. There's so much taboo. Um, things like 
you know, the sexual revolution, polyamory, swinging, all these, these deviant, you know, again, because of the repression modalities, I think have emerged out of that. Um, and to your first point, Aaron, I think this is a great question. Um, the communal tribally linked masculine is the strongest masculine, in my opinion. Um, the isolated masculine in the corporate high rise on Wall Street or the isolated masculine in the suburbs is a very weak form. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of evidence for that. Now, in a healthy tribal communal dynamic, and by healthy, I mean there are clear agreements, there are clear shared goals and values. There's some form, and it doesn't have to be religious, but there's some form. It can be musical, it can be um, revelatory, it can be initiatory, it can be psychedelic. There's a lot of different ways to create communitas that actually work. They're all ancient. I think there's some modern spins we can obviously do with tech and all the things we've learned. We can bring it all forward. Um, I'm not proposing we go back to archaic structures and just like, you know, live in loincloths. They tried that in the 60s. It was a nightmare. We can integrate and go forward. And the communal, the communal tribe collective, and again, this is, this is a sense I have. I haven't ever, I, I would think, fully experienced it. And maybe it does exist somewhere. I hear good things about Tamara in Portugal. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that community. It has a really long running track record. But the, the issues of sexual competition with men and women would be non-issues as nullified by the communitas field, where if the whole village is presencing it and there is communication, even if so-and-so is sleeping with so-and-so and this person wanted to, and the, you know, all that stuff's just gonna exist. You know, we're tribal, we're apes we're gods and we're apes, it's gonna be there, but I believe it can be dealt with in a good way that doesn't create you know, a, a game where people lose. I think it can create a game where there's maturation and growth. And this is again, elders. If there are elder men that hold positions of power and are properly respected, their, their like mediation and ability to navigate these spaces is critical if it's a bunch of young 20 alpha males that are in that are basically 12 year old boys in puberty and strong masculine bodies yeah it's going to turn into orgies it's going to turn into violence so if you have the intergenerational dialogue if you have communitas if you have agreements and collective value systems i believe it's it's navigatable and that's a belief so i'm, I'm trusting that's the case before, before, before you pick up, Daniel, I just wanted to qu uh, quickly say also about this, uh, what Kevin said about the win-loss dynamic, that if someone gets sex, someone else views that they don't get sex. Like if, some, like, if, like, if, if, you, if you have sex with someone, someone else can feel as if you were attacking them or as someone was, something was taken away from me because they, because they had sex. This is because the sexual- Want to create a positive sum. Yeah, it's not, yeah, we can't, it's hard to view sex in a positive sum frame, basically. Be, be, because, because sex is one, a super enjoyable energy, and two, a, a, a feeling that we, it's scarce, a feeling that it's lacking. So when you combine this, the extreme enjoyment from sexuality and the perception of lack of sexuality, it gets hyper valued. So the only way in which that could be reduced is if there was an authentic sublimation where that same level of enjoyment is produced inside the individual. And the only experience I know that can do that is the psychedelic experience. So if psychedelic experience was a part of the community, would that change the way we discuss sexuality? I don't know, that's a possibility, but I'll give that to you, Daniel. Sorry for taking over. Thank you, very good thoughts still. Um, to I'm always the last one in the round. And that's what also my, my aim is always to, to bridge Kevin and Cadell and put, put my synchronicities into that. That is always always my, my role and my position and where I find myself I also very confident in that. But sometimes it's hard because there are so many thoughts on that. <laughs> but um, what I can say from here is um, I do think the we're gonna have a cultural change on the nuclear, nuclear family. It's not especially in those that are still in this process where the man makes the money and the, the woman uh, takes care about the children. But we have 
other cultures where this um, this polarity has has changed into a multiplicity we are right now with the with the uncertainty on how we're going to proceed on that and if it comes about a tribal community or digital networking person that is highly linked with everybody or if it's someone in in the city where you have the multiplicity of possible relationships to to find yourself your sexuality and so on it becomes uh quite disturbing and and the need for some stability is, is on the stake what i believe is that the desire that drives sex and power is one of the challenges that we have to not look outside of ourselves but inside of ourselves if we find desire in in the sex and in in power about making money it's because it is the driving force of of change and if we get stuck in it we also get stuck in our self-development that is why i appreciate on one hand to have an intimate relationship where you can also see someone else with all the love and have the sexual pleasure but i also see that um, as something that is not permanent that can be permanent but uh, as soon as you reach uh, a point where you change yourself that much that the attraction that the other person gives to you is not something anymore that you feel as something desirable that you change yourself and if the relationship changes with you that is for me the most beautiful outcome that you can have so the relationship continues and there's continuous growth parallel what i see it's uh with the multiplicity is that this changes or the possibility to change or not to to go through big changes of one person is that breaks up or more often which could be repaired more easily in smaller communities because there is not much of the multiplicity to get there but on the other hand, I feel really if you just step back from um, from this is this is just love or this is just sex or this is just unconscious desire that driving me. But if you put yourself into a, a reflective mode and a mature consciousness about your relationship and your community, you can take it always as something to grow from and that should be if you stick together in a relationship or not doesn't matter what i did find out that if you have like a lot of different sexual uh intercourses with everybody that disturbs a lot uh every kind of of progress it, you just get scattered instead of getting uh, into one and it's scattered those to the, the other persons. So I don't think that that this is like, I mean, if you would have like one person a week, sex every day, someone else, I don't think that is really healthy. I mean, I've also done this and uh, I couldn't recommend it. But um, to, to go really deep into a trusting, uh, relationship where you can hold spaces for each other it, it's something very meaningful but you don't have to get also in the trap to be the therapeut of someone else you know but just see okay that's that's me that's my growth you know and I do believe that when you go into different phases of learning of changing yourself you know you just become your desires become less because you already got it you know if you really follow like naturally okay i have this desire to have this sexual intercourse or this kind of powers and so on i mean there's the shortcut to say well i i 
I don't have these desires, you know, just happy as I am. But there is also like the long way of saying, well, I want to follow these desires to feel complete. And then you're going to figure out that another desire will come up, you know. And I also see that as something very meaningful to follow because otherwise you suppress it. So I also um, would say, follow your dreams, follow your desires. But at, at some point, the desires uh, become less. And you really ask yourself, what is, what is meaningful behind all of that? And, and there I'm, 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 I'm more into, into this Buddhist or perspective where I say like the happiness is like really here now. And as soon as you have a desire, your mind and your emotion goes into the future, which is not something that exists. And, and happiness you find just in the here and now. But to make this flow happy, you know, and coherent with your life, it's a free fall because you don't know what's coming next. Just uh, accepting it more and more. So for all the persons that, I mean, there is a lot of unhealthy sexuality too. And I do think that it is useful to have some regulations for these spaces, but to have spaces for, for everyone. But in, in the course of how you develop yourself, your desires changes. And I do see that the desires have also a certain arrow, which, which is to realize oneself completely as something that is one we don't lack anymore. Yeah. But you become real creator of your full potential, which is like being the one. Yeah, I leave it like this for, for now. There's still so many other Excellent. questions. Excellent. Um, Kevin, you have a question. Would you unmute and ask your question? Oh, me. Hi. Uh, let me see. Hold on. Let me find it. Um, yeah. Um, so chap chapter two of your book is something about uh, the history of archetypes. And I know, Kevin, you also... Oh, I just realized my background is a bug. I totally didn't realize that. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and uh, like Kevin... Alec bug. I know, right? Um, and Kevin, you sort of paint yourself as, you use the word archetypal to describe yourself. Um, I'm wondering what the role of the framework of archetypes um, plays in your respective analyses and understanding and in your trilogue. And could you give some examples of, say, how different archetypes have manifested themselves in the modern world, um, where they're lacking and where they can be improved, or what kind of new archetypes we should be striving for, if that's the right way to word the question. Thank you. Okay, so this is, this is one of the topics where Kevin, Daniel, and I, I think, have disagreements. So this question of, uh, of archetypes. So I'll say, I'll say for me, I'm, I'm kind of, as I understand the Jungian concept of archetypes, it's that the archetype, say, for example, the wise king or the divine queen or, you know, the divine feminine, the divine masculine, these are kind of reified as eternal essences that we discover in the collective unconscious. And for me, I don't really think archetypes function in that way. I think archetypes are um, basically ideas that emerged in evolution and that those ideas reflect a type of evolutionary strategy in relationship to evolutionary constraints. So for example, you could imagine primates very much like humans evolving in language, self-consciousness, that whole thing happens. And then, you know, conscious entities find themselves in sexuated biological bodies and they come up with two ideas which kind of cover the field of, you know, um, 
one body seems to be um, stronger. It doesn't have the capacity to reproduce, uh, has whatever, more, more muscle mass, so it's su suited for certain functions. Another body is shorter. It has the capacity to reproduce and so forth, so it's going to get filtered into these functions. And that these get reified through different, different historical epochs. I think that the crucial dimension in my analysis is the asymmetry in the archetypes in the modern period, because women are collectively wanting to come into the traditionally male field, but it's not really the opposite way. So, and, and that's biologically determined to the degree that men can't, men, men biologically can't reproduce. Like men are biologically unable to really embody that function. Whereas it's not true the other way around. So to me, what this asymmetry in the archetype suggests is that these archetypes have nothing to do with eternity. What I mean here is that both, to me, here's the difficult thing to think. How can we think the asymmetry in the archetypes and the way in which they'll be historically transcended for something totally different? And I think that that historical transcend transcendence to something totally different involves the way in which our identities get wrapped up between man, woman, and child. So in some sense, I think this internalization of man, woman, and child internal to each individual is where we'll find new archetypes. But I, I don't know yet how that will manifest. Of course, in our current universe, I think we see many archetypes of superheroes, all sorts of action figures, many different virtual figures in like World of Warcraft or sit, you know, there's all sorts of ways in which consciousness plays with its body in a virtual avatar form. And that's where I try to think, what is the future of the virtual avatar vis-a-vis -vis our body? I'll pass that to you, Kevin. Yeah, I love this question, Kevin, and not just because we have the same name. Um, I think I, I fall much more into the Jungian camp and maybe the more psycho-spiritual domain on the teleology. I, I do believe archetypes. I mean, I, I don't know. I wouldn't claim that they're some kind of eternal blueprint like Plato's forms or something, although I think that, that's an elegant way to talk about it but they do seem to be psychic dominants that are older than humanity itself. And so when you analyze collective dreams, when you analyze the myths of the world, especially the creation myths, when you analyze and just look at all the different ways humans have used animals, symbols, story, man and woman, God and demon, there's all these interesting archetypes, usually conveyed through symbol and story, that are ubiquitous. And so how do these manifest in our life? Well, they manifest in huge ways when you have eyes to see. And so I find that as a man, um, archetypes can be extremely empowering. There's also a shadow side of being possessed by an archetype and grandiosity, which is one of the, the great trials for many men and their ego is falling into grandiosity, which I certainly in the past have been guilty of. Um, women also, with these life-giving feminine earth archetypes, there's a very powerful pathway of empowerment. There's also a pathway of disempowerment and dissolution of a personality fit for a relationship or a personality that's healthy and integrated in a society and is contributing. So the way I characterize archetypes is really like, when you are embodying your best self, and we, we can all have a reference point for this, right? Like you can just imagine right now, let's just use the sexual space, you are looking your best, feeling your best. You said all the right things. You legitimately felt like a charismatic, badass, sexy motherfucker. You know, whatever your orientation is, male, female, who you were dating, whatever, in that sexual space. I believe in that moment, you were very much embodying an archetype. You could take a thousand of those cases. We could all share the case where we were that person. And I guarantee we could, through correlation and through just perception through pattern recognition recognize the qualities of an ideal man or woman in that situation that is something like an archetypal hero and there's many that you, I, that you can work with I, I really enjoy the amazing work by Moore and Gillette King Warrior Magician and Lover where he in detail 
analyzes and breaks down the shadow sides, the inner child and the heroic aspects of king, warrior, magician and lover. And I think for women, it's the same There's a quaternity. You know, I call it queen, priestess, huntress and um, which one did I miss? Lover as well. So this is this is really important to understand if you are inclined to view the world through an archetypal lens, which you might be inclined to view that way if you really love myth, if you really love stories, if you really are attracted to supernatural characters, personality, and meaningful qualities and emotional experiences, not just you know, Marvel superheroes, although that's dope, and not just you know, fairy tales and Arthurian myth, although that's a rich place of lore, but actual um, idea, thought forms, emotional energies, and integrous thought and deed that characterizes what we, what we think of as the best of us, right? When you think of a human that you would want to emulate, I believe these humans are to some small degree more aligned with these archetypes than others. So I'll leave that there. Okay. Um... My notion of archetype is that there are, as, as Kevin said, uh, I studied anthropology in, in the first place, cultural and social anthropology. There are myths and archetypes that you find all over places, times, and cultures that didn't have any contact to each other. You know, so there is a, a notion, they're not exactly overlapping, uh, like, they're not like one and one, but they have like different notions. If if you if you ask him what I did is an investigation, it's like the the archetypes try to embrace like a wholeness of, of the universe. You know, when we have it more detailed, we have it in, in horoscopes or in, in calendars and so on that, that have like a circular way of, of seeing things. We have, for example, water and, and fire as, as two opposing archetypes is so that we can find in ourselves with the fire of a passion, the fire of the anger or the emotions of our tears and in, in the water or also in, 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 in depression or whatever. So there are like the ideas that we create out of our, our stories, out of our language that is an ideal type, as it was so sad already, that we're striving for. And this direction in we, that we're striving for to be the ideal one, the ideal is not the real. So the ideal is always an idea that, that leads us. So the archetype is also an idea that leads us to something, something bigger because it contains multiplicities of ideas from what we think about that is to something that makes us more beautiful more true more more good somehow and in in the in the distinction of what kind of archetype we're striving for is also our desire of what we want to become but how this becoming into the real of your unique oneness is displayed is not the fixed idea but it becomes the real of what you feel is ideal for the real for you so it has like the whole notion that can drive you to to become a better person to become a notion of or to, to become someone someone that is yeah ideal and one hand the the most i think where it comes to also into places where the ego kicks into the place where you become someone that thinks okay he's the king and he is like actually bad king and stuff like that is is very uh dangerous too so one of the things that are Quite crucial in here is is a humbleness in working with with archetypes that you don't think you're creating uh, the king inside of yourself and you're the only one. Everybody is a king. Everybody is a lover. 
and there is plenty of space for for every, everyone's uniqueness you know i think that that is very crucial working with archetypes and and when it comes to to the from the multiplicity into where we say okay we have for example as kevin said four archetypes where we say this is here this is that it is to come to the notion where there is only one you know where we, you become just the one that you are and that's where you're not thriving anymore to be something more ideal that you're not and this is the, the end of archetypal thinking but as long as you you wish for being something that you're not the archetypes are re really useful as long as you take a humble path with it yeah thank you well we've got many questions still here um but we have come to 90 minutes it might be prudent to bring this to a close as peter might say um do you guys have any closing thoughts, anything that you would like to end with um, before we do? And maybe one day we can bring it in for a round two. Sure. I think the thing that's being presenced throughout a lot of the questions, a lot of the things that are being presenced in the chat have to do with this paradox between the one and the multiplicity. So the one on the one hand is this desire for monogamy, this desire for long-term relationships, this desire for exclusivity, this desire for closeness and intimacy with one other. And on the other hand, there's this desire for multiplicity, which is a desire to explore identity and a desire to go into difference, a desire to you know play with identity in a different way, to be untethered from historical constraints and so forth. And I just think, I just think that the way in my personal life I have come to deal with this paradox between the one and the multiplicity is that if you go too strongly into the one, you become almost static and fixed in your identity to the point where neither you or the other can change. And that becomes paralyzing. And if you go too much in the multiplicity, you go to the point where you're kind of like schizophrenic and fragmented and disconnected and, and you're spread out over too many places. And somehow, somehow we have to be able to cultivate nuance with our sexual energy and build long-term meaningful relationships with others, whether we're sexual or not with them. And at the same time, leave space for exploration. How to do that, in my view, is going to be unique to every individual. But the path of extreme oneness and the path of extreme multiplicity are both dead ends. So it has to be some sort of dynamical balancing of, of oneness. And that's going to be different to every person. And I think it's different on a developmental trajectory, meaning that it's going to be different at 20 than it is at 30, than it is at 40, than it is at 50. Um, so I think that that's been presenced a lot. And I just wanted to speak to that because I think metaphysically, it's actually hard to language this, this, this balance. That's, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. This is all your questions, all this chat, man, I am so overwhelmed. This has been really cool. So thank you guys. Yeah, really, really grateful for this opportunity. Tyson, love you, brother. Thank you so much for sharing this with us and and inviting us on here. You know, I, I think the biggest takeaway is that wow, being in a in a dialogue and a discussion like this with people that are very deep thinkers and are putting some heavy things on the line, like heavy in a good way, is really refreshing. Um, that's one. Two, I think clearly that we all are desiring in our own way to attain clarity and mastery around communal living in the sexual space. And that, that is pretty cl clear from a lot of these questions. And I think that's incredible because that is at the leading edge of what I think a lot of us wanna do, smart villages, eco villages, whether you actually wanna live in them or you wanna be part of a digital commons. I mean, this is what it's all about, I think, as we move forward. So I'm excited to continue that conversation. And you know, if for some reason it's not clear, if you love this, you'll love the book. So sexmasculinitygod.com, 
Um, I humbly ask for Amazon reviews if you really dig it to help us get it out there. We're going to be launching a Kindle version as well, potentially even an audiobook version in the future if that's more your bag. Um, but right now the paperback is amazing. It's our baby and we're excited to share it with you. So thanks y'all. Yes. Thank you all for these amazing questions, for holding that space, Tyson. Wonderful conversations in here. I love this, this structure of the trilogues. I, I really can uh, recommend it. The final remarks that I have to kind of uh, is to do, do a counterpart to, to Cadell about the oneness and the multiplicity. I do believe that both is not a dead end. Maybe it is a dead end, but it, it, is, it is an end of, of, of the evolution. That is when you can stay in the multiplicity by being one and seeing the multiplicity as each being the one and as long as you see yourself as as there is there is another as as something foreign to you that that is not a one as well as you're the one you know as long as uh, that is the case there is a, the potential for growth as long as you see there is there is something that is other. There is a person that is other that is not you. As long as that coexists with, with the notion that we, we are all the other person. And I truly, I, I truly experience that. And not to everyone, otherwise I don't know what, what I would be. But I do believe that everything that you feel like an other should really um, give you the, the power to say, oh, that's my learning challenge. Everybody that really also makes you angry or makes you sad or whatever is like, this is, this is another one that is me. You know, what does it teach me if I don't feel it? That, that is something that is also me. So I do see that, that this is like the, the pathway to go, you know, and that fills me hope and that fills me also with, uh, with a direction that I have been always following my life with, with all the changes around, you know, that is like the, the stable ground where I where see, see development in humankind and in myself. And yes, if you... Leave some comment on Amazon, wonderful. That would help us to get a better out and have proper conversations like this. I loved it. Thank you all. It was really amazing. Talk to you all. Terrific. Thank you so much for being here. This has been awesome. I'm going to make just a couple announcements here. Um, of course, go to the stoa.ca to see future events. On October 3rd, we've got a bioenergetic workout. I'm speaking that one because I think just because I think Kevin would be intrigued by that. Um, and on November 16th, Noam Chomsky is going to be here. So Peter's doing a great job with the STOA and bringing in a lot of interesting people. So if you would like to support Peter and the STOA, you can go to that Patreon link, give him that support. The link for the book, Sex, Masculinity, and God, is there again. So do order the book and leave a review. And I dropped one more link to Flowing with Unknowingness, which is an event that I host every Monday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time, where we practice freestyle, freestyle rap and spoken word as a way of getting into communitas and deepening our relationship with uncertainty. So thank you, everybody, for being here. I look forward to seeing you again next time. Thanks again, everyone. See you.